We're beginning Parsha Toldot, and the focus of the Torah shifts to the third of the Avot, the third of the patriarchs of the Jewish people, and that is Yaakov and his lifetime. A provocative question to begin with. We know on Pesach night that we sing a song and says that there were four Imahot, the Jewish people have four matriarchs, the Shlosha Avot, and we have three patriarchs. And we're going to see tonight whether that was really the original plan. But before we get to that, the title of this class is Facing In, Facing Out, in terms of perspective. And I want to look at something together in the Torah, the beginning of this week's Torah reading, Parsha Toldot, which will be informative and provocative in terms of the moment in Jewish history we're at right now also vis-a-vis -vis the world. So this week's Torah reading begins in chapter 25. Uh, it begins with sentence 19. But we're going to look particular, and, and just for a moment of background, it talks about the fact that Yitzchak married his wife Rivka when he was 40 years old. They went through a long period of beseeching God for children. And lo and behold, Rivka becomes pregnant. And there's a struggle in her womb between which she can't understand. She goes to seek out God, which means that she seeks out, um, she goes to the representatives of God in the world outside of her family, her husband's family, which would be shame or Aver. And she, and she gets the message that there are two, very dramatically in sentence 23, that there are two nations within your womb, two regimes will be separated and the might shall pass from one regime to the other and the elder shall serve the younger. And this is a prophecy that she knows, she doesn't share with anyone else. And lo and behold, she gives birth, she has twins. And these twins are very much identical, undifferentiated. And we know that from sentence 27, because it says they grew up, and now, all of a sudden, at the age of 15, Esav emerges as a differentiated person, a hunter of the field. And Yaakov, at this point, emerges as a pure person, a dweller of tents. And then the Torah informs us that Yitzchak preferred Esau, and that the Rivka, the mother, preferred Yaakov. Let's pick up the narrative now in sentence 29, and let's try now to isolate our focus on the narrative in, in 29 till the end of this chapter. And Frank, if you are available and you have a chumash handy, if I'm not putting you on the spot, I'm available. if you read sentences 29 through 34 for us, please. Jacob simmered a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Esau said to Jacob, pour into me now some of that very red stuff, for I am exhausted. He therefore called his name Edom. Jacob said, sell as this day your birthright to me. And Esau said, look, I am going to die, so of what use to me is a birthright? Jacob said, swear to me as this day. He swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, got up and left. Thus, Esau spurned the birthright. Okay, so if we look at the story in isolation, um, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? Or as we put it in the world today, who's the perpetrator and who's the victim? What's going on here? So obviously the setup is, it, would, it certainly seems, as here, Jacob, Yaakov, the, the, the patriarch of the Jewish people, is in a position to completely exploit and take advantage of his twin brother. And he does so. Nice brotherly request. 
hey, you have some soup there? How about uh, giving me some? I'm famished. Oh, you want some soup? Okay, how about a little deal here? Sell me your birthright. Give up your whole preferential position within the family. And Asaph says, well, you know, I've really got no choice here. Um, my life seems to be in the balance. And he agrees. And Jacob nicely fulfills his part of the bargain, doesn't, doesn't cheat him and give him nothing. But J but Asaph swears, and Asaph just comes to despise that which he's given up, which is a usual psychological result of things. End of story. Now, who wants to speak up in defense of Jacob here, of Yaakov, the, the patriarch of the Jewish people? Who could um, give us some commentary here or some insight that would, would at least ameliorate his role here as the exploiter of a vulnerable, helpless brother? I'll volunteer with a little help from Rashi and Ramban. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Rashi, so I, I think the line you're focusing on is, uh, I am going to die. And and neither Rashi nor Ramban uh, uh, consider that to be an expression that if I don't get food, I'm, I'm going to uh, fall over and die. Uh, Rashi says uh, that es Esau thought he would very likely die as a result of performing the service improperly. You know, there, there are parts of the service where if, if you do them wrong, you uh, very severe punishment. Um, and uh, Ramban says, uh, I'm going to die means that he's a hunter, so he's in constant danger and, and he could lose his life at any time. Right, and therefore possessing something um, as everlasting as being the firstborn, the scion of the family, is not something of value to him. Okay, so this softens the story a little bit, right? It's it it it, it, it you know, and, and and in a certain sense, I mean, I, you know, I, I, we all need to think about the images that the world is looking at now and how they're isolated and how they're played out and what preconceived notions people have here. But there's, let's just go with Rashi here. There's Rashi. Rashi changes the narrative that Yaakov wasn't looking to take advantage of his brother. He valued the opportunity to be the Bechor, to have the carry forward the legacy of the family. Esav, he knew, for whatever reason, we don't have in the story, but he knew he didn't have any value to that. And therefore, he, he, he still took advantage of a situation and said, look, you know, soup, it's just soup, you know, but um, it has some value. And the opportunity to be to carry forward the legacy of Abraham and Isaac is not something of value to you. So how about if you relinquish that to me? Because I do want it. It's something that is of value to me. And um, and I'll give you the soup that, that sort of reduces the tension of the thing. But I want to ask a provocative question here, which in fact, the Ron, a medieval commentary who I think we mentioned last week, but he lived in the in the 1300s. Duran asks a very provocative question elsewhere in this Parsha, but we're going to apply it here. What the Ramban wonders is, if God wanted Jacob to be the Bechor, God could have gone about it in a much more above board, simple way. I mean, something as, 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 as straightforward as God intervening in the birth, which we read about where they sort of struggled to get out and Esau was the firstborn. God could have easily played midwife a little bit more and seen to it that Jacob was born first. So therefore, there's, we're ending up with a story which seemingly on its face has strong implications of impugning the integrity of Jacob, the forefather of the Jewish people. And frankly, you know, I think we would all feel, knowing what we know at this moment, that if we could edit the Torah, we might say to God, you know, God, why don't we just leave this story out? You know, this whole thing about the soup and, the, you know, well, let's just go on with the story. We'll get to the dramatic ending when 
when Jacob appears before Isaac, his father, and presents himself as if he's the brother. And because in the end of the day, that's a blessing. And 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 and, and at the end, Yitzhak says, so too should he be blessed. So whatever that experience is, it's clarifying, it's re revelatory. Let's just leave this story out. Even if it happened, let's not call attention to it. So we're going to use the Ron's approach to this section as leverage for us to really think about the fact that this is part and parcel of God's plan here, that God has a plan here to have this story play out, which is a nice idea in general to have about all the stories in the Torah. In other words, you know, God in his with his invisible hand, sometimes it's visible, like when it takes the Jewish people out of Egypt and all these miracles happen, but in general, with what we would call an invisible hand, God directs the affairs of mankind and humankind, and he saw to it that even though Abraham and Sarah went down to Egypt, nothing tawdry, tawdry happened with, uh, with, 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 with Sarah. Yitzhak digs wells, has a lot of opposition. Somehow the king discovers it. The king comes out on his side. It's God, almost without creating much of a stir, has a way of seeing to it that things end up the way God wants it to be. Clearly God wanted Jacob to be the Bechor and carry forward the legacy of the Jewish people. We have no qualms of that. And, and especially today in history, looking back at the whole history of the world, we understand that in the end of the day, Jacob and his wives were had 12 unbelievable children. And, and they had, after they sorted out their differences, which we'll learn about in the coming few weeks, um, they ended up creating a people out of a family and we, the Jewish people today, we're the descendants of that. We we are the we verify the fact that this was God's plan for the world, and therefore that gives our life special meaning and importance, and gives us what we call in Hebrew a tafkid, a role to play in human history, which we readily accept and understand with three thousand five hundred years of hindsight, but which is unfolding at this moment. And, and I want to, it can't be overstated what this moment was in the history of the world. Because again, the background here is that 2,000 years of world history were opportunities for mankind to somehow reclaim the status of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And generation after generation, thousands, millions of people forfeited that opportunity. And then finally, when we come to after 2000 years and Abraham emerged, so God says, I'm going to select Abraham and place upon him and his descendants this responsibility to make the world purposeful and meaningful and, and, to, and so that the world can continue with a moral, what we would call today, historic purpose in terms of elevating mankind, giving each and every individual human being an opportunity to choose goodness, to choose life, to live an upstanding life. Those who do, do, and 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 and, and are rewarded accordingly. Those who don't, don't, and they miss out on that opportunity. So, but this is a very dramatic moment because we had Abraham acknowledged by God as being the founder, founder of the Jewish people. A lot of discussion. Ishmael is born from a different mother, not from Sarah. Maybe he should be the heir. Maybe Eliezer, the loyal servant, disciple of Abraham, should be the heir. No, no, God insists on it being Yitzchak. And here we are at this point in the Torah where Yitzchak emerges as this patriarch carrying forward the legacy of Abraham, albeit in different terms. Yitzchak is more shrouded. Avram represents chesed, kindness, going out into the world, engaging with the world, uplifting the world through acts of kindness and teaching and, and pointing out the existence of God and intervening in wars when he has to. We don't have any of that in the life of Yitzchak. With Yitzchak, we have what we refer to as gevura, a mastery of oneself, says in Pirkei Avot, in Ethics of the Fathers, who's a powerful person, a person who's able to master their own nature. And that's Yitzchak. Yitzchak is the internal, developed, complete human being to, to such an extent 
that he was offered as if he was a sacrifice to God because he had that total integrity to him. And that's the way he lives his whole life. He never leaves the land of Israel, of Canaan, we call it at this time, but he lives in the Holy Land promised to Abraham, never sets foot outside of it, and, and, and certainly lives a life of sterling self-mastery and is an example for all of us to look up to and aspire to throughout history. Now we're up to the third stage. And the third stage is very important. The Talmud tells us that a, when you want to create a rope, if you have two strands, you can't create a rope that's really lasting. But if you have three strands and you weave them together, chut a, a, a strand which is made up of, th a, a rope made up of three strands, that's unbreakable. So we get to the point now where we're ready for God to solidify this whole process of there being a chosen Jewish people, a Yisroel in the world, as we're ultimately called, a, a, a nation perceiving of God. And that's ready to unfold. And lo and behold, in the beginning of this week's Parsha, we're thrown a curveball because there are two brothers born at the same time to the same parents, Yitzhak and Rivka, and they emerge simultaneously. And why would that happen in God's plan? And if you really want to have a firstborn, not a firstborn, wouldn't it have been just simple for Rivka to give birth to one child? She could have other children afterwards. Whatever the story has to be, let's think hard about the details of this story, what the import of it is, and what the import is in general in the way that we perceive reality. Because obviously from the sentences that Frank read to us before, it would be so easy to misperceive reality, and yet God purposely orchestrates these events, purposely includes them in the Torah itself, because it has tremendous importance for the way you and I live our lives. So let's unpack this a little bit. And we'll do it not quite in order with the sentences, um, but yeah, let's do it in order of the sentences. Why not? Let's go back to sentence 22. Okay, chapter 25, sentence 22. And what do we read about there? The children struggled in her womb. And she, the mother Rivka said, if so, why should I exist? She went to inquire of God. And she was told there are two distinct nations that are come out for you. Rashi adds the coloring that when Rivka would pass by the house of study where people were sincerely learning the legacy of Abraham, who was alive at this time, and Isaac, and they were teaching Torah as it existed in the world at this time, or maybe they passed by the yeshiva of Shem and Aver, the descendants of Noah, who were also still teaching about God actively in the world. So Jacob would struggle to get out. He would be interested. He would become engaged. And hence, this poor pregnant matriarch of the Jewish people feels that tension of what she assumed was one child struggling. Something's going on outside of you right now that I want to attach myself to. And then lo and behold, she would be passing by a house of idolatry, and which makes sense because they lived amongst idolaters. Yitzchak may not have been as active as his grand, as his father Abraham was in terms of engaging the world, but he certainly did engage with the world. And all of a sudden, in Rivka's mind, this same child starts struggling to get out and attach himself to idolatry. Now, do we believe in freedom of choice or not? We do. So a question that's asked is, What's going on here? Was was God just creating a circus here? And God saying, okay, I'm going to put a bad kid and a good kid. I'll stick them in the same womb. They'll grow up next to each other. Um, why would God, why would, why would that be the next stage of solidifying the legacy of Abraham in the world? Why, why would God possibly countenance such a thing taking place? Why would that happen? And is it fair if Esau is just the guy in the black hat 
and Yaakov is the one in the white hat, we don't subscribe to these ideas. We subscribe to the ideas that all human beings are created in the image of God, and therefore they exercise free choice. So first of all, to defend our issue of free choice, if we just look to sentence 27, we see something also that's very remarkable. I want to set the stage here. I didn't number them out as well as I did last week, but I still, uh, this could be an ex a left brain exercise to quote Frank in terms of what we're looking here. Sentence 27. The lads grew up and Asa became one who knows hunting a man of the field. But Jacob was a wholesome man abiding in tents. Now, they actually had the word became, but all the commentaries say the following thing. These two twin boys lived the first 15 years of their life indistinguishable from one another. If one was exceptionally bright, the other was exceptionally bright. If one was exceptionally powerful, striking, whatever qualities there were, these two twins presented themselves as, as twins sometimes do, as like you know, two hard drives in parallel with one another, sharing information, backing one up from the other. They live very parallel lives. And hence, Yitzhak and Rivka raised them in tandem with one another. So this could sound like a great story. So let's we go through 15 years of this, and that's the timeline that Rashi says. We won't go into why, but there's good reasons for that. But if that's the case, so in other words, we have these two twins growing up in a very holy household. They've got parents of Isaac and Rivka. They've got grandparents of Abraham. Sarah did pass away before they were born. But old grandfather Abraham is still there, maybe not living in the same tent, maybe living a, a few villages away, but certainly part of their lives. And they're treated the same because they seem to be soaking up everything. So at this point, that struggle in the womb is perplexing. And Rivka must be thinking to herself, well, I don't really get it. You know, I put out two bowls of oatmeal. They both eat nicely. It's like thinking, I, I want to teach them some Torah. I sit down with the two boys. They gobble it up. They discuss it together. They're, on, they're, they're, they're both bright, capable, intelligent people. Because the tone of the sentence is that they became differentiated only at that point of life. Now, when we think of people being differentiated, what do we think about? So the natural thing, whether you're twins, not twins, siblings, not related to one another, everybody has what we call their tuna, their nature, their inner nature. These two boys were born in sync with one another. But all of a sudden, at a certain stage of their lives, they and behold, the Torah is really saying, Esau showed this proclivity to go out into the fields and hunt and, 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 and engage with the world to conquer it. And Yaakov came forward in him as he matured as a more retiring, thoughtful, studious, interfaced person. That's what the narrative is saying. You can't get away from that being inherent in the narrative itself. So you had these two boys all of a sudden emerging as very distinct individuals. Now, what's Rivka and, Yak and Yitzhak, the two parents, supposed to think to themselves? Okay? They think to themselves, well, this is the third generation that's going to solidify the leadership of the Jewish people. We, we, we're blessed with twins. We see now that they have different natures. It must be that in a complementary way, these two are going to become joint or partner patriarchs of the Jewish people. And in fact, you will find sources. They're not so out there, but they're in there when you look in the more Kabbalistic realm that almost hold this idea that perhaps God was thinking that at this stage, if I want, if God is thinking, 
to solidify the legacy of an Abraham and to see to it that endures throughout history because now we're in the third generation is the third strand. That strand itself has to have a dual aspect to it. It has to embody the engagement of the world that Abraham has established so that it can have an impact on all of humanity. And at the same time, this stage has to capture that inner life of the Jewish person, those values, those ideas, that philosophy, that gentleness, that way of looking at the world, which, which, which really is what the Jew, you know, when they call us the people of the book, which is a term that the world seems to apply to us, we certainly see that Jacob sits in the tents. He's study, studious. He's wholesome. He's not interested in finding out that what's the latest opportunity to go out in the world and conquer and subdue and hunt down and, and do these things. So, but But there's a tension going on. And if you think, if you put yourself in the shoes of the parent here, they would say, wow, look how different our two sons have become. And look at the tremendous potential here for this third stage of rooting the Jewish people in the world, of making permanent the legacy of Abraham and the legacy that Isaac and Rebecca are, are, are putting forward. Look at the opportunity to here to have this tandem of one facing out and one facing in, one being ready to defend the Jewish people and the Jewish ideal and subdue the world around, and the other focused on the holiness and sanctity and the connection to God. Now, the, understand, connection to God is not mutually exclusive, because in the spiritual realm, here's the way it works. We know that there's two aspect to developing spiritually. One is subduing evil, meaning one's evil inclination. That's what Isaac was the master of, because Ezehu Gibor, who is a, considered a powerful person, someone who's able to subdue his own personal inclination, to reduce his ego, to reduce his insatiable appetite for physical gratification, to handle his interest in being honored and looked up to and and, and 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 standing above everyone else, those inclinations need to be subdued for a person to have a wholesome, full-fledged relationship with God. So you need, so to speak, the warrior ready to go out and do battle and to subdue evil, both evil that comes internally to the person and evil or threats that would come from the outside. So we shouldn't be so vulnerable. And then, of course, of course, you need the Jacob, the voice of Jacob, the studious one, the spiritual one, the one who can share ideas, the one who can inspire the world. You certainly need that. And, and if you have this tandem, look what a wonderful thing it is. But what happens, and here again, we need Rashi, that when it says in sentence 29, Let's pick up sentence 29 now, because this is, these are immensely dramatic moments. But Yosef Yaakov Nazid. Yaakov is simmering stew. We use this translation here. Okay. Rashi right away thinks, well, why is the Torah calling attention to that? So we know that, that, that lentil stew is something traditionally associated with sitting shiva, with the loss of a person. So, so Rashi adds the coloring here. This is the day in which Abraham dies at the age of 175 years old. Okay, it means how old are these two twins? They're 15 years old. So it's a sensitive moment where, again, what is the focus here? The, the, the foundational patriarch of the Jewish people has just passed away. Now we're left with Yitzchak as the remaining living patriarch. And in their hands are these two twin boys, each with their own natures and their own proclivities, who, who they imagine being either dual avot, dual patriarchs of the Jewish people, or co-patriarchs, some sort of structure which I can't really pin down from the sources, 
but that they would work in tandem with one another and they'd always be associated with one another. Now you see that original prophecy that rang in the ears of Rebecca comes true. They're two nations, but they're forever co-joined. One's going to have to serve the other. One's going to be, they're always going to be linked in very specific ways. So think of all these wheels turning. But now what happens? It's the sensitive day, sentence 29. Asaph comes from the field and he's tired. And the, the language here provokes Rashi and the Midrashim to say, Asaph comes from the field from a day of murder, a day of conquest. By tradition, he killed Nimrod that day and, and, and took from him these special garments, which are going to play out at the end of the story, that he made his own. He, he subdued the world in a marauding, uncivilized way. He committed, according to tradition, the three cardinal sins of worshiping idolatry, of violating the sanctity of another person's wife, and of committing murder. So he's hungry. Why is he hungry? Because we know once a person pursues these base instincts, there's no satiation point. They, 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 they pull a person along in this way. That's what's taking place. And when when so when he when Asaf says, I need your food, there's an aspect here of the world is now mine. Okay. Give me the food. Pour it down my throat. The world has become mine. I'm 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 mastering it. And not in the way, of course, that was hoped for, which would be a protective way so that goodness would endure and be protected and last forever. But here, I mean, to use, Asaph has gone over to the other side. The battler against evil, as we so, hap so often happens in life, when you're associated with evil, when, you're, when your nature pulls you towards evil, and, even, and you're torn between the sense that I'd like to subdue this evil and prevent it from influencing the world, but by the same token, this evil that I'm familiar with, that I'm in contact with, has a certain lore to it. Once you cross that line, sort of like, to use a poor analogy, the bad cop, who at a certain point becomes the bad cop. So Aesop is at this point. Yaakov recognizes it. And here Yaakov has a very specific concern. This is sentence 31 here. By Yomer Yaakov. Michra Kayom et Bukharat Khali. Sell today your first right to the firstborn to me. Why? Abraham has exited the world. Clearly, the baton is passing on to them. To whatever extent Asa retains this status as a patriarch and goes over to the other side he can wreak spiritual havoc with the whole world. Because just as Abraham was entrusted by God to be the bearer of morality in the world, and that that's the job that we, the Jewish people, inherit from, from as descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as long as Esau had the mantle of the Bechorah, even though he was violating its every tenant, even though instead of subduing evil, he was embracing evil, the world became in a very dangerous place. And perhaps the world couldn't even continue with a legacy segment of Abraham committing this type of travesty in the world. So Yaakov acts quickly. As of right now, this vulnerable moment in the world when the third generation legacy of Abraham needs to be solidified forever so that the Jewish people could carry this mantle on throughout history. I need you to relinquish the mantle of Bukhar, which you have. I need you to relinquish your entire interest in being a legacy of Abraham and Isaac. Because otherwise, the world spiritually is in complete danger. 
and that can't continue. And here's where Asa is understanding. And Asa says, I, I, I'm going to die, meaning this legacy no longer suits me. It no longer fits me. If anything, it'll cause my death, either, as Frank said earlier, either out of me so violating the standards for which this right of firstborn places upon me, or because my lifestyle itself makes any spirituality like irrelevant to me. It's not, it's not even in my radar screen anymore. So he's happy to sell it. With this in mind, let's open our eyes to this optic of what's taking place here. What the Torah is telling us is taking place at this moment is not someone in an advantage position taking advantage of someone who's vulnerable. What the Torah is showing here is that a Jacob is ready to step up and say, yeah, we need defenders. We need outward facing people. And I've lived my life until now as an interfaced person, as a person totally spoke, focused on bringing down holiness into the world and, and, and plumbing the depths of God's wisdom and Torah and sharing those ideas in the world and building them up. But at this moment where my that brother, that patriarch has forfeited any sense of, of, of holding up his part of the agreement, I have no choice but to purchase it from him, to take it off his shoulders, and somehow accommodate myself in the best possible way to fulfill this. Let's step back from the story for a moment and see what some of the applications are. Because certainly we are not standing at this moment at this foundational point of Jewish history. But as Jews, we know every segment of life, every unfolding event has with it immense choice and challenge and has a big impact on where the world goes from here. And I want to, therefore, I want to apply this story in the following way. Pathetically, there was a discussion going on in Israel at the start of the war, which always happens in war. You're going out to fight. God bless you. Defend the Jewish people. Why aren't you coming out to fight with me? I'm going to stay behind. I'm going to study in the yeshiva. I'm going to say Tehillim. I'm going to do a spiritual part to complement what you're doing. And let's do this in tandem. So you have this always discussion, well, who's more important? Oh, the, the, this one thinks only the soldiers matter. This one thinks only the learners matter. The, you know, this one thinks the non-religious are causing the problem. This one thinks the religious is causing the problem. All these polarizing, divisive, pathetic ways of looking at life, which, which would inform our story and make it look so horrific. But again, here's the opportunity for us. And, and, I, and as I mentioned, Rav Luchter in Israel debunked this story in the following way. He says, understand something. You have a person who's critically ill. So there's two things going on with a person when they're critically ill. One, you need a doctor to come in and diagnose what's the root problem here? What disease is going on? And, and how, can that, how can I bring this human being back to health? And at the same time, we need a different doctor to come in and say, he's bleeding. We need to sew up the wound. We need to prevent infection. We need to take charge of the day-to-day -day care, which is also preserving of life. So each doctor has their part to do. And when the patient regains their health, they don't go out in the hallway and start punching each other, each one claiming, well, I'm the one who saved the patient. After all, I'm the one who figured out what the underlying condition was and determined a course of treatment. Uh -huh. But what you did couldn't have done anything. It rather becomes a holistic, complementary effort to do this. This is the, the biographies of so many great Jewish people speak to this as well. And I want to give one cogent example. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, 
who passed away in, in circa 1888, I think, he's credited with, with turning the Jewish people towards inner spirituality at a time when it was sorely needed, at a time when, when the observant Jewish community was being picked off by modern ideas because they weren't grounded in a sense of self-understanding and, 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 and a sense of really coming to greatness from within themselves. So he did that. But if you read his biography, his teacher was someone who no one ever heard of. His teacher was someone who stayed out of the radar screen, lived in a small town, always covered up his own greatness. Rabbi Yisrael was a young married person. He lived in that city. He discovered him. He followed him around. He studied with him. He learned from him. And then at a certain point in his 20s, Rabbi Yisrael had to make a choice. Do I follow my teacher's way of life and remain secluded and holy and good and, and, and become a spiritually supercharged person? Or do I undertake meeting the needs of the generation and go out there and start teaching ideas which are going to meet resistance and which I'm going to have to argue about and, and fight for and hopefully leave a lasting impact on the Jewish people. And we are the beneficiaries, thankfully, that Rabbi Yisrael Salantra remained a humble person his whole life, who remained a person whose inner greatness grew and grew and grew. But he saw the necessity of going out and fighting for the future of the Jewish people on a spiritual level, on a physical level, on every level possible. And, and, and in a certain sense, giving up that inner secluded life for the sake of everyone else. This is the model the Torah has. It's not, am I, am I the holy Jacob living in tents? Or am I the person going out and fighting against evil and subduing it? What we're, we're, we're going to see in the coming weeks in the Parsha is that because Esau is eliminated from being one of the patriarchs of the Jewish people, and in fact becomes the antagonist of the Jewish people throughout history. So Jacob has to end up doing both. He has to go out into the world. He has to live in a, an inhospitable home of Lavan, and he has to establish his family there. And he has a, he's a person who has to confront the world's most difficult challenges while at the same time remaining his inner essence of Jacob, the person who resides with intents and who and, and his life is difficult. And he describes the first 130 years of his life as being struggling, difficult years. Why? Because I had to do a double job. Each of us in our own way have to do a double job. Each of us has to be prepared to work to subdue evil within ourselves first and foremost, our inclinations which are to push other people aside to take care of number one only. Each of us has to come to grips with containing and subduing those voices within us that say only I matter. And each of us also has to build an inner life of connection to God. That's the dual challenge. Sur me ra, vase tov is the way it's described. Do battle, subdue evil and build up goodness within yourself. That's what the book Mesilat Yesharim is based on and goes back and forth step by step what the moral challenges are that a person has to subdue and what are the opportunities for just growing and, and deeping an attachment to God. And we as a people have to do that. But of course, what's the link that so often is missing? The link that so often is missing is that mutual respect that valuing of all aspects of what it takes to persevere in the world. And what we're seeing now, thankfully, in an amazing, amazing way, we're seeing the Jewish people in Israel connecting with one another as, as we've never seen it before, supporting one another. People going out, standing at the border of Gaza now, just to be able to prepare a warm meal for a soldier, just to sing for them, and dance for them. You know, a story that particularly touched me, reported by a non-observant Israeli woman who, who wrote this, the following action happened. She's at home. Her husband's at war. 
Her husband, unfortunately, is released from his very responsible job because one of his fellow soldiers was killed and he had to be at Har Herzl to attend that funeral on behalf of the IDF. He leaves the Gaza Strip. He heads for Har Herzl for this service. He has very little time on his hands. He notifies his wife, this is what's happening. Maybe we can get together for a cup of coffee. They, they do that in a religious neighborhood. They go into neither, they go into what they identify as a Haredi coffee shop. They sit down, they have a cup of coffee together, they reconnect. He's looking at his watch, I've got to go back. Calls the waitress over and says, I'd like to pay the bill. And he's told, the bill's paid for. We out of appreciation for your service and for the risk you're taking. Okay, very nice gesture. All these kind of gestures are going on. The woman walks outside. A Haredi girl approaches her and says, I want you to give me a bracha. I want you to give me a blessing. And at first, the woman thought, you're mocking me. You're this religious girl. Keep all these mitzvot. Have this very austere lifestyle. I'm, you know, the wife of a soldier living my life in Israel so different than yours. What are you talking about? And the girl looks her in the face and says sincerely, you're giving up so much right now on behalf of the Jewish people. You're supporting your husband's service. You're living on your own without him. I hope someday to be as great as you are in terms of factoring in the needs of others and living my life that way. And I want you to give me that blessing. This is the takeaway from this section of the Torah. Esau and Yaakov, ideally, in God's original plan, were meant to live lives in harmony and tandem with one another, each of them reciprocally supporting one another in the most important endeavor in life, which is keeping the world on track. It didn't work out that way because Esau couldn't maintain that position of engaging with evil so thoroughly without becoming evil on his own. That opportunity was lost. But forever, we, the Jewish people, have this opportunity to genuinely appreciate one another, to see the big picture, to realize that every ounce that of, of effort and attention and commitment each and every one of us makes for the good of the people of the Jewish people, to, to uphold our opportunity to really rectify the world and make the world a place that's meant to be. This is our opportunity throughout history. It's so obvious now. It's so obvious that you can take any narrative and you can construe it. You can take that optic and you can make it as pathetic looking and as horrific as you want to take it. Or you can take that same optic and understand that God does have a plan that God does, there's meaning in every aspect of life. And even, unfortunately, what we're going through right now has tremendous value and meaning if only we take advantage of the opportunity. And lo and behold, the beginning of this week's Torah reading gives us very big keys and insight in how to see through the fog and to understand with clarity what the moral lessons are are to be. We're stepping up to the plate now as we probably never have in memory. And please, God, we should continue to act this way, to support one another, to appreciate one another, because if we, by doing so, we're certainly going to be uplifting the world, and we're certainly going to be fulfilling God's plan, which is so hard for us to perceive right now. But we'll see it unfold, please, God, and we'll measure up the way we're meant to. Thank you. Thank you.